Hello and welcome to the Hot Rod Bible Study. I uh, hope that you enjoyed the photograph of my assistant uh, producer director in his Roadster pickup truck. That's my friend Jim Sheridan, who generally is the one who's throwing water bottles at me and other things and changing the way the 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 thing is being pictures being taken now which i had it all perfect but you know of course he's producer director so he gets to change things or anyway so we're having fun i uh, hope you are too tonight we're going to be in matthew 18 we're going to do the first 20 verses uh, a couple of things uh, under the heading of instruction on humility i think all of us need some instruction on humility and the other one is the offended brother uh, those of you who may have been involved in various church splits have probably heard of the Matthew 18 idea on that. So anyway, that's, it's a good one. So uh, please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time we get to share together. Thank you for your word. Thank you for giving us your word. Thank you for sending your son down to pay the price for our sins. There's so many things to be uh, thankful for to you, Lord, that uh, I could just go on and on. But I'll just thank you for your word. I pray that you open your our hearts and minds to your word. Keep me from overrunning myself on how I'm speaking. Keep me from making a mess of this thing and keep me out of the way, please. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Matthew 18, first verse says, at the time, the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Then Jesus called a little child to him, set him in the midst of them, and said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as a little as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe to the world because of offenses, for offenses must come. But woe to that man by whom the offense comes. If your hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. It is better for you to enter into life lame or maimed rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast in the everlasting fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. It is better for you to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. Take heed that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I say to you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father, who is in heaven. For the Son of Man has come to save which was lost, that which is lost. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep, and one of them goes astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine and go to the mountains to seek the one that's straying? And if he should find it, assuredly, I say to you, he rejoices more over that sheep than over the ninety-nine that did not go astray. Even so, it is not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. But if he will not hear, take with you one or, one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. If he refuses to hear, hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you as a heathen and a tax collector. Assuredly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or more, pardon me, two or three are gathered together in my name, 
I am there in the midst of them. That's where we're going to stop tonight. And again, we see the disciples here. Uh, it cracks me up because uh, they have done this in the past and will continue to do this. Are you amongst themselves? Who's the greatest out of the bunch? Well, I did this. I did that. And so it starts off at that time. The disciples came to Jesus saying, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Again, in Luke chapter nine, you know, they argued among themselves it, about who was the greatest. And, uh, people still do the same thing today. You know, that kind of deal is as well. I'm greater because of what I've done or my great grandfather was this traveling pastor or whatever the deal is. Here we go. Philippians chapter three. All right, let's get to Philippians. Chapter 3, 4 through 7 says, Okay. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh. This is Paul speaking. This is really good. If anybody had the opportunity to brag, it was Paul. says, Though I, had, I also might have confidence in the flesh. If anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I have more so circumcised on the eighth day, of which the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning righteousness, which is in the law, blameless. But what things were to gain to me, I have counted loss for Christ. So if anybody had any reason to brag about how great he is in the kingdom. It was Paul, and he was the first one to say, hey, count it all loss except for through Christ. All right. Now, verse 2. Then Jesus called a little child to him. Now, Jesus didn't scare off the little kids. You know, somebody who is in authority, well, let's just figure the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes and the, and the uh, chief priests and all this stuff, would probably scare the little kids. The little kids wouldn't want to be there. But Jesus called the little kids to him. And guess what? He does the same for us. He calls us as little children. It says So he set them in the midst of them and said, assuredly, you know, here he is. He sets them in the midst of them. He sets his little child. And he's setting, setting the disciples straight. He says, assuredly, I say to you, Unless you are converted, which means to turn around, just like repenting, okay, and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is pretty clear on this. It's not how great you are, how many, uh, how much money you give to the church, how many things you purchase for the church, how long your family has owned that certain pew in the church, or whatever the deal is. It is not that. It's entering the kingdom of heaven like a little child. Here's what the smart guys have to say about it. R.T. France said, A child was a person of no importance in Jewish society, subject to the authority of his elders, not taken seriously except as a responsibility, one to be looked after, not one to be looked up to. Okay, children should be seen and not heard. We have all heard this Time and time again, especially from stubborn old crowds. Okay, next from Carson. D.A. Carson says, the child is held up as an ideal. Check this out. Not of innocence, purity, or faith. Remember, we're all born in sin and sin. Our mothers conceived us. Okay, that's what David had to say. This is the whole thing. We're not pure, but what are we as children? But of humility and unconcern for social status. Little kids are not concerned about what Susie next door is thinking about. They're just happy to be there and do stuff, right? Okay, so that's the kind of the thing that we need to think about. We don't need to be concerned about what everybody else is thinking about us or what status, social, social or otherwise, that we have. We not need not concern ourselves with that but be as little children and come to Jesus. Uh, Luther says, just as a child neither takes nor seeks sovereignty for himself, 
This shows that there is not sovereignty among ministers. Okay, we got we got the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the chief priests and all these things. No, no, no. He's saying that just all ministers are on the same level. And guess what that means? Uh, you may have heard of this phrase, or may not. It's about the um, um, priesthood of all believers. and something that Luther taught on, which meant that all believers have the same authority as a priest or pope or whatever. We all have the ability as believers to share the gospel. We don't have to go through Mr. Absolution Man to get our sins forgiven. We go straight to Jesus. Okay, so that's the thing. We, all of us who are believers, are ministers. Everyone has different uh, different things that they're called to, different things, but nothing is greater than anything other. And then any other. And this is what pretty much is what Jesus is saying here. It says, if you don't uh, become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Verse four goes on to say, therefore, whoever humbles himself as a little child is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Think about that. Um, who's the greatest example for us? Well, Jesus himself. Uh, did Jesus uh, humble himself? Yes. As Paul said, he humbled himself to the point of death, even death on a cross. It says this in Philippians. So Jesus humbled himself. Okay. That's the greatest example we can follow. Verse 5. Whoever receives one of these little children in my name receives me. Again, Jesus identifies himself with the most humble although he is the greatest. Isn't that something? And that's something for us to think about. You know, here we have the creator of the universe who humbles himself. Why should we do anything different? Verse 6, But whosoever causes one of these little ones to believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone which on average weighs about 3,300 pounds, were hung around his neck and if he were, and he was drowned in the depth of the sea. So you put 3,300 pounds on this guy's neck and chuck him into the ocean. Be better than for them to cause a little one to sin. Um, I think we all know that it's evil to sin, uh, but it is um, worse to cause others to sin especially little innocents, okay? That's the worst thing. And this is what he goes on to say. He says, woe to the world because of offenses against God and others, right? For offenses must come, okay, because we're in a sinful world, but woe to that man by whom the offense comes. Why is that? Well, you know, he has no excuses. We have no excuses. It's none of this, oh, the devil made me do it stuff. That's baloney. We have no excuse to cause others to sin. Hmm. Verse 8. If your hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. It is better for you to enter into life lame or maimed, rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into the everlasting fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you, it is better for you to enter life with one eye rather than having two eyes and be cast into hell fire. Now, obviously, this is hyperbole. Jesus is using this pretty much to make sure that we understand how great this is, right? He's, this is a serious manner. Okay. David Guzik puts it this way. This is great. If I cut my cut off my right hand, I can still sin with my left. If my left eye is gouged out, my right eye can still sin. And if all such members are gone, I can still sin in my heart and mind. God calls us to a far, far more radical transformation than any sort of body mutilation can address. It is a more radical transformation that God calls us to. And 
I when it talks about radical transformations, I think of all my friends that I know who have been radically changed by Jesus Christ. Guys who are bare knuckle fighters, guys that you want to have in a bar fight with you, guys who wouldn't step foot in a church because they were disenfranchised as a child or whatever the reason is, who are radically changed by Jesus Christ. Still tough guys. Still tough guys. They didn't become sissies. But they're radically changed in their heart by Jesus. Amazing. Just amazing. Okay. And I'm proud to have them as friends. Verse 10. Take heed that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I say to you that in heaven their angels see the face of my Father who is in heaven. Uh, despising little ones. Despising these innocents. Uh, figure, you know, Jesus talks about us being as little children. Uh, it's inconceivable to see that. Uh, inconceivable in my mind, but people do. Uh, talking about their angels, we're going to turn to Psalm 91. Here we are. Psalm 91. And we're going to look at verses 10 and 11. No evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you and keep you in all your ways. He will give his angels charge over you and keep you in all your ways. And this is what Jesus is referring to here, is that, For I say to you that in heaven their angels see the face of my Father who is in heaven. Verse 11, For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. Now, some translations leave this verse out of there. It's kind of interesting. You'll look, you'll read, and it'll show verse 10, and then it skips to verse 12. This verse is left out. Uh, some of them say that there wasn't an original in Greek, uh, whatever. Personally, I, I think it reinforces the following verses that we'll be looking at here. It says, what do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them goes astray, does he not leave the 99 and go to the mountains to seek the one who has strain? Again, the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. Okay, 13. And if he should find it, assuredly, I say to you, he rejoices over that sheep more than over the 99 that did not go astray. Uh, here, there's the parable of the prodigal son. You probably all heard this, but think about it. Here we got this young guy who decides that he wants his inheritance. So he goes to the old man and says, hey, pony up. I want my inheritance. I've had enough of this crummy life. I want out of here. And the old man gives him his inheritance. So what does he do? Goes off to a foreign land and squanders it on wild living. Okay, you know, it's, it's, it brings to mind something. You think years ago... Before my faith was in the place where it is now, you'd think about, boy, if I knew I had one day to live, what would you do? Boy, you'd go party, go do whatever you, whatever kind of fun stuff you could do. Today, if I only had one day to live, I'd go hunt down all the people that I have been neglectful in sharing Jesus with. That's what I would do. But back then, same, you know, I think all of us have had this, oh yeah, boy, I'd go party it up. Well, this is what the the uh, prodigal did, and then he ran out of money. Then he realized how dumb he was and went back to his dad going to beg him, say, hey, let me be one of your slaves because they get they got better things going on than I do. And what does the dad do? Well, he flings a ring on his finger and a nice, beautiful new coat and throws a party. You know, go kill the fatted calf. Let's throw a party because this one who was lost is now found. Same thing. Jesus is referring to here with, with these sheep. So, verse 14. So, even so, it is not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Now, we're going to go a little bit further into the New Testament. We're going to go to 1 Timothy. There we go. We're going to go to 1 Timothy. And I turned that over where I'm not sure. Okay. 1 Timothy uh, 2. Verses 3 and 4, where it says, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of our God and our Savior, who desires all 
men. This is one of those all means all, that's all all means, desires all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. He does not one of these want one of these little ones to perish. Verse 15. Moreover, if your brother sins against you, right? Sins against you, and you go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. Yet don't go on face plant and tell everybody about how terrible this thing is or go gossip to your friends or whatever. You go talk to them. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. So yippee, problem solved, everything's under control. A uh, friend of mine told a story about a co-worker of his who received a call from some guy who was really irate. And I mean, he was cussing him up and down and all these kind of terrible things. And so my friend's co-worker just hung up on a guy. Then he dials the guy back. And he says something like this, Hey, George, you won't believe what just happened. There's some guy who just called here and said he was you, but it couldn't be you because I know you don't talk that way. Wow, what a way to defuse the situation. The guy said, Oh, I'm sorry. And they were able to take care of whatever issue that was. Man. I, I wish I had the wherewithal to do something like that. I think the vast majority of us are inclined to reply in kind. If somebody's chewing you out, all of a sudden the hackles come up and you're ready to, ready to do battle and same kind of junk can come out of your mouth. But man, that was so clean. That was so clean. But settled it there. Now, verse 16. But if he will not hear, take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. This is Old Testament. This is Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 15. It says, One witness shall not rise against a man concerning any iniquity or any sin that he commits. By the mouth of two or three witnesses, the matter shall be established. Okay, and this whole thing is, is that way, this is old Jewish law. Boy, you got to have two or three witnesses to say, okay, this is really what happened, instead of just bring along some other guy. Okay, now, it goes on in 17. If he refuses to hear them, then go tell it to the church. Again, who's the church? Is it that building over there on Avenue E? No, what it is, is us the community of believers. We are the church. We go meet in church buildings, and we just shorten it up to church, that's fine. But you tell it to other believers, right? Tell it to the church. But if he refuses to even hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. That really cracks me up, because what was Matthew before he was called to follow Jesus? The author here, the one that, that God used to author this. Well, he was a tax collector. And they didn't much care for tax collectors because they were in cahoots with the Romans, the occupying forces there where they were in Israel. And these guys also would kind of yeah, pat it a little bit and get a little bit more. They, they made some pretty heavy money off of these guys by overcharging them. And also, again, they were in cahoots with uh, the occupying forces of the Romans. And so they were not very well liked. And so when Jesus says, yeah, treat him like you would a heathen or a tax collector, you know, they didn't treat him very well. It's kind of interesting that. Now, here's the thing. It's kind of like there's another story in 1 Corinthians where Paul is writing to the, the uh, church in Corinth there. And he was saying, hey, you know what? You guys got to straighten up. You even got some guy who's openly there who's been out fooling around with his dad's wife. Now, he wasn't fooling around with his mom. He must have been fooling around with his stepmom type of thing. Says, you need to take care of this. So the church did. They said, hey, this is wrong. We're bouncing you out of here. You know, you can't be in this fellowship. You need to straighten this out. So... The guy sees the error of his ways, and he straightens up, flies right, and everything's neat. Comes back to church, what do they do? Now we can't let you in. <laughs> so what does Paul have to do? Write another letter saying, hey, man, this guy 
this guy confessed his sin. He repented. You need to bring him in, you know, just like us. Any of us confessing our sins and repenting, we're forgiven. You know, we need to treat others in that same way. If they come up and say, man, I'm sorry that I did that to you. You need to forgive them. It's just that simple as Christ forgave us. The, the things that we've done put him on the cross, and he still forgave us. That's the reason why he was on the cross, is to forgive us. That, how can we not forgive somebody if they ask us forgiveness? And that's another. You know, here I'm going down another rabbit hole, but that's another thing. If somebody has wronged you, and you carry this with you, hold this grudge all these years, they may not even know that they wronged you. That's why you go and talk to them, right? And try and settle this. But even so, and they don't confess, the best thing for you to do is forgive them. Because all you're doing is carrying that stuff around. You're upset because they wronged you doing this. They don't even think they wronged you. And what do you do? You carry it around for the rest of your life. Who's it hurting? Certainly not hurting that person who wronged you. You need to forgive them. And that's a hard thing to do. I was told that years ago when I had a family member that really, really had some issues. And a friend of mine said, Wilbur, you got to forgive them. And I said, I will as soon as they come over and ask, you know, for forgiveness. He says, no, nope, you got to do it. You just got to do it. Wow. That was not an easy thing to do, but it was the best thing to do. So that's something that we need as believers to do is forgive those who wrong us. Does that mean that we buddy-buddy with them and give them another chance to make us a doormat? No, but we need to not worry about forgiveness. Okay, now, verse 18. Assuredly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. This is a repeat, sounds like a real repeat from chapter 16. Remember, this is an announcement of the impardonable and the pardonable. Those that you bind, that's impardonable, the announcement that that's not a pardonable sin, or the pardonable sin. Okay, that doesn't mean that Mr. Absolution Man has the authority to forgive sins. I'm going on on this, and forgive me. I, it's just something that's stuck in my craw today. Okay, now, next, verse 19. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. The Greek word here is pragma, which we get the word pragmatic. It means an issue uh, as in a common legal case. So what this is talking about, probably referring to the church matters, if 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 two of you agree on what these church matters are and you talk to to the Father in heaven, these things will be getting squared away. It, again, church matters dealing with sinful brothers. So we were just talking about here in the previous verses. Following, fo finally, verse 20 says, For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there in the midst of them. Just think about that. Jesus is here the HRBS, just as much as he is in some large church setting. Doesn't have to be large. Doesn't have to be the fanciest thing there ever was. Is that when two or three are gathered in his name, he's there in the midst. I'm thankful for that because he's here. All right, that does it. Questions, comments, or smart aleck remarks? I don't see any coming from the peanut gallery again. Please, I, I know I say this kind of tongue-in-cheek. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to talk to me because um, I don't want to cause somebody, <laughs> cause one of these little ones to sin. I don't want to cause anybody to sin by something I may have said. Uh, again, I, I am not a perfect man, so I can mess up. And sometimes we just got to get things Communication squared away. So if you have any questions or comments and prayer requests, please, prayer requests, if you have any of those, please be uh, feel free to contact me with that. And so with that, let's close with a blessing. So the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. 
Amen.